In the world of astrophotography, there has been a long-running discussion, sometimes even heated debate, about which is better, OSCs or astro color cameras, or the alternative, monochrome astro cameras. Advocates of OSCs have argued that while well, you can film your entire image, all of your colors at once, you only need one filter, so the whole process is just simpler, cleaner, and more efficient. While advocates of using monochrome cameras have argued that mono sensors receive 100% of the lights on all the pixels, so they produce sharper, better images. And some of the discussion that goes back and forth is based on actual data. A lot of it, though, is just based on opinion and personal experience. As I've noted in a previous video, I spent about a dozen years of my life in university studying the sciences. My specialization is psychology, but I spent a lot of time studying earth sciences as well. And whatever field of science, there is a principle that the proof or the evidence is what matters. Theory must bow to evidence. So I prefer to stay evidence focused. So today, we are going to go really deep into this topic, looking at resources from authoritative sources, camera makers, as well as some of the research produced on this topic. There are seven sources that all played a role in this video, and they're all linked below if you'd like to take a look at them for yourself. So hang on, because this is going to be quite a ride. We are really going to take a deep dive into this. So, why use a monochrome camera? It is correct to say that 100% of a monochrome camera's pixels are receptive to all of the light that they receive. This allows monochrome cameras to obtain somewhat higher resolution and between 1 and 1.5 f-stops improvement in their light sensitivity. And if we were to just accept that at face value, right off the bat we'd say, hey, the mono camera is the best option, no questions asked. But the reality is more complicated than that. For example, if you want to turn a mono image into a color image, you're going to have to shoot color filters over it, and ideally a luminance filter too. The color filter is only going to transmit red, green, or blue, meaning each filter is going to discard two-thirds of the visible spectrum of light. Narrowband filters will discard even more light. So some of the advantage in the color camera is lost, at least in terms of shooting time, though it still maintains its edge in resolution. And the story goes, it maintains its edge because it's using 100% of its pixels. As you're about to see, that's not true. But let's take a look first at the advantage of shooting with a one-shot color camera, an OSC. Its big advantage, of course, is that it is shooting in color. It does a lot of work for you all at once. You don't have to shoot a separate luminance, red, green, and blue channel. And you can use modern filters like dual and tri-band filters to have it capture multiple but specific bands of color at once. And this makes one-shot cameras very simple to use. That's an inherent advantage. When I've been out shooting astrophotography, there's typically a lot going on. I'm monitoring the camera, I'm monitoring the system that relays information between the telescope and the computer. I'm dealing with the occasional glitch or bug that comes up. Shooting astrophotography is complicated enough, and using an OSC, I don't have to worry about whether the filter wheel is working right, or the autofocuser has properly focused after changing a filter or if a change in weather might leave me without data. OSCs get a lot of that stuff out of the way. Using them is simple, and that's a real advantage. There's also the advantage that they are enormously less expensive than monochrome cameras, because monochrome cameras, if you want color images, are going to require filter wheels and filters. In fact, a full filter set for a monochrome camera is going to require a luminance, red, green, and blue filter, and various narrowband filters, meaning that putting together a full, decent, monochrome camera set can cost three to five, even six, seven thousand dollars, easy. Whereas you can get a decent OSC in the range of four hundred dollars American and a decent dual band filter for about a hundred. But let's pretend here that you live in a dream world and money is not an object and your only concern is maximizing image resolution, getting that best image possible. Then which is better? If you look just at the data and do not consider all the reality in between, the mono camera looks better, no questions asked. When you consider all the reality in between, and that reality in between the theory, that's a real hang-up, and that changes the picture a lot. To understand how, let's first try to understand both the way a mono camera creates its images, and an OSC, a one-shot color, creates its images. Digital cameras have sensors that consist of millions of pixels. Every megapixel is a million pixels. A pixel is like an individual bucket within the sensor that collects light. In the case of a monochrome camera, there is just the pure sensor collecting the light that falls onto it. Now, color is not an inherent quality of light. 
Color is a perception that our brains assign to certain frequencies of light. From a digital camera's perspective, all light is just energy. It's somewhere between no energy, or black, and complete energy, or white. So a mono camera just shows us images between black and white. To make their color, filters have to be presented in front of the sensor. Red for red, green for green, blue for blue, or narrowband filters which focus on certain specific frequencies of light such as H-alpha. Separate images are taken with each one of the filters and then the image is composited together to make a full color or partial color image. A color camera actually works the exact same way as a monochrome camera because they both have the same sensor. The sensor simply detects the presence of light. In the absence of light, its pixels are portrayed as black. In the presence of light, there's some shade of brightness all the way up to full brightness or white. Color cameras can portray color though because they have a device over them called a color filter array. One of the most common ones these days is the bare layer. The bare layer presents two lines of color. One line is red, green, red, green, red, green. The other line is blue, green, blue, green, blue, green. And if you were to think of these lines laying side by side, they would make, you might think of it as groups of four pixels that go red, green, green, blue. So the color array and the color filter array or bare layer filter slice into its frequencies. Low visible spectrum frequency light is filtered into the red part of the color filter array. Blue frequency light is filtered through the blue parts of the filter array, and green light is filtered through the green parts naturally. We now have light on three color channels. In processing, the light from each pixel is compared with the strength of the light in the surrounding pixels. Remember those surrounding pixels have different colors. And what you might think of as an average is derived from the contrast and comparison, and that average is related as a color in the final representation to you, the viewer. Now there is a very common misunderstanding among astrophotographers that because there are very few green objects in space, that little to no data is caught on the green channel of a one-shot color camera, and therefore the green pixels go to waste. So half the sensor of an OSC is unused, causing an OSC to have lower resolution. But this isn't true. As we discussed in the previous video, a lot of data is caught on the green pixels, even with astrophotography. A tremendous amount of data, in fact. This happens because the color filter array is not filtering light by specific frequencies, it's filtering light by broad bands of frequency. And there is a tremendous amount of crossover between those different bands. If we look at this graph for the ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro, we can see that it registers light as energy in the red channel all the way down from about 570 to over 1000 nanometers. The red channel, in fact, picks up a little residual light all the way to the far side of the blue channel at 400 nanometers. Meanwhile, the blue channel registers light energy all the way from 400 nanometers up to about 575 nanometers. But that's not a hard cutoff. It also registers light all the way up to about 850 nanometers. But it decreased levels up until about 775 nanometers, where there is a marked increase in how much blue that channel registers. The ostensibly unused or wasted green channel is in fact registering light all the way from 400 nanometers to 850 nanometers. And there is significant and powerful crossover at the green-blue point somewhere just under 500 nanometers and at the red-green point somewhere just under 600 nanometers. Quite literally, there is no point at which every pixel on an OSC is not active. And as noted previously, as much as 70% of the luminance data is on the green channel. And this happens because even if a DSO is showing us light mostly on the red and blue side of the spectrum, the green channel is receiving quite a bit of energy from the red and blue side of the spectrum because so much of the receptivity of the green channel's color band crosses over into the red and blue side. Here I've added a bar graph portraying the frequencies that are passed by a typical dual band pass filter. And you can see that a great deal of visible electromagnetic energy is passed in the crossover between the green and blue frequencies, and about a quarter as much at the red-green crossover. But the green channel does not see red or blue energy, it simply sees energy. And when all this energy is added together, the green channel develops a very powerful signal, up to 70% of the signal of an OSC. And thus we see that an OSC is using all of its pixels, despite the myth that the green channel goes to waste. So why the persistent myth that an OSC loses resolution? Well, these color channels have to be combined in a process called debayering or demosaicing, and that's where some resolution loss happens. At this step, an algorithm is applied to compare and contrast the amount of energy from each pixel. 
with neighboring pixels. This algorithm makes possible the perception of color, but it comes at the cost of a bit of resolution loss, as much as 20%. But if you're a hardcore mono camera advocate, don't throw up your hands and cheer that monos are better yet. Because, as is the case with so many things, the picture is much more complicated. So the ability of a camera to portray resolution can be expressed in a mathematical formula, and it states that resolution is half the sample rate. This applies to both color cameras and mono cameras. Now it's half the sample rate if the detail of an object is horizontal or vertical to the lines and rows of the pixels of a sensor. But very little in nature is straight and is going to line up with perfectly with the lines and rows of the pixels of a sensor. And the objects that we image in space, planets, comets, galaxies, nebulae, and so forth, often are fairly chaotic in the way that they are laid out, especially nebulae. And so this resolution limit often approaches closer to 70%. That's good. More resolution is always better, right? Now, since a mono camera is not divided up into three groups of pixels, its sensor will be able to capture more resolution because it's able to use the full width and breadth of that sensor, giving it more of a sampling area. And also, because it can use the full width and breadth of that sensor, its sensor is ostensibly going to be less subject to aliasing, such as the jagged lines or moire that appear when there is an overwhelming amount of data in an image, more data than the sensor's pixels can register and make sense of. On the other hand, a one-shot color camera sensor is divided up into three parts. One quarter is devoted to red underneath the color filter array, one quarter is devoted to blue beneath the color filter array, and half is devoted to green. And this is where some problems with one-shot color cameras begin to happen. According to Nyquist's frequency principles, the green channel, uh, due to the ingenious way in which it is laid out, can capture as much detail as a mono camera with vertical and horizontal information from a target, but it loses a little detail if that data is at a diagonal. And the red and blue channels lose additional detail because the green channel occupies half the sensor, but the red and blue channels each occupy only a quarter. So they suffer a bit more from lack of sampling. They're also more inclined to aliasing, which again appears as jagged lines or moiré patterns. So the resolution loss in a color camera does not happen because the green pixels are inactive. They are catching data. And it's the fact that they are catching data that works for us because the big picture is more complicated than just saying resolution is loss. And in fact, as we shall see, much of that resolution, in fact, most of it, is recovered. One effective way to deal with resolution loss is, by quite simply, increasing the number of pixels in a sensor. And I'm not talking about the chase for more megapixels that's very common among people that are new to photography, as well as astrophotography, always thinking the camera with more megapixels is better. What I mean is that more pixels within an area allows for more sampling. And more sampling means less resolution loss and also importantly fewer opportunities for aliasing to occur. Now there is a limit to this too. There are problems with oversampling but that's a topic for a different video. What's important to bear in mind here though is that modern sensors have such a high pixel density that detail loss, at least what the human eye can perceive in an image, becomes fairly immaterial. It might matter more if your goal is to really blow up a picture and zoom in on it but it's otherwise immaterial. Technically, a monochrome sensor, using all of its pixels, has a better response in terms of capturing all the detail and resisting aliasing. But you hit a point of diminishing returns and our technology is there now. Any decent modern astrophotography camera has such a density of pixels that the detail loss and the opportunities for aliasing are barely relevant to the human eye. And sometimes the introduction of color is more important than just throwing in detail, as you can see in the image above. The image above was taken from the James Webb or the Hubble, I forget which, and both were processed and composited in the exact same way. The only difference is I desaturated the one on the right to make it black and white. And without the eye catching reds, the eye loses a lot of detail, whether or not the detail is actually there in the image. We'll come back to the topic of pixels in a little bit, but for right now, we're going to also look at the evolution of processing technology because that's also important. I can't stress enough how important it is too because this entire process of recording images these days, it's digital. After the light passes through the lenses of the telescope and strikes the sensor, the whole process is digital and electronic. This means your camera, 
your computer and all your software is just seeing a bunch of ones and zeros. And it's the magic in how those ones and zeros are processed that provides tremendous opportunities for the evolution of the OSC into a fully capable astro camera. I mentioned earlier that in the process of demosaicing, up to 20% of resolution detail can be lost. That's a historical number, and the modern situation is much, much better. Color filter arrays, and in particular the Bayer layer, have been around for decades. In fact, Bayer patented the technique in 1976. The process of working with the Bayer layer has been studied and analyzed for almost 50 years at this point. And even before the turn of the millennium, more and more effort was focused on improving the capabilities of the Bayer layer as it became apparent that digital technology was about to overtake the photographic world. Thus, we find ourselves at a place where demosaicing an image leads to a lot less than 20% resolution loss. In fact, in a paper dated to 1999 by Chang, Chung, and Pan, they noted that with the rise of digital photography, it was just starting to come into its own at that time, it would be increasingly necessary to maximize the quality of images that cameras with bare layers can produce. And this led to the invention of the variable number of gradients or VNG method of demosaicing. This demosaicing method is available in many forms of software that process raw images and remains one of the most efficient methods for demosaicing or debayering images from astro cameras. In fact, in Chang, Chung, and Pan's paper, they note that the VNG method increases the resolution that can be recovered from a color filter array by as much as 15%. I'm not entirely sure how they meant that 15% to be interpreted, but if it's an additive number, that means we're actually getting back as much as 95% of the resolution of the image of an OSC after its colors have been demosaicked. No, a mono camera doesn't need demosaicing, and it will always give you 100% resolution. So what does that 5% difference really mean? Well, at this point with the technology's development, except in some unusual circumstances, it means nothing. We've reached a place in terms of technological development that a decent telescope and a decent camera is going to provide us with such good performance that now our limitation, the only real limitation, is nature itself. And what I am fundamentally referring to here is seeing. This was observed, tested, and noted in the paper for the Royal Astronomy Society of Canada, created by Blair MacDonald and Jason Dane, which I noted in my last video. And this is because, unless you happen to live on a Chilean mountaintop someplace, or someplace like out in the desert where it's especially arid, and you get nights of extraordinary seeing, the atmosphere itself is going to limit the resolution that you can achieve long before the limitations you might experience by whether or not you go with an OSC or monochrome camera. And that's just a simple fact. And to bring out the very best resolution from an OSC, it is important to use the best demosaicing algorithm. These days, there are many, and they all have their pros and cons. So it's worthwhile to take some time to understand their various advantages and disadvantages in one given situation or another. And if you're working with PixInsight, it has three demosaicing methods, including the VNG one that I mentioned earlier. Now I mentioned I was going to come back to the topic of megapixels. Megapixels in themselves are a complex topic, and we will look more at them later. Persons new to both photography and astrophotography tend to become fixated on megapixels operating under the idea that more megapixels makes better images. What really matters for our purposes here is not how many megapixels are on the sensor, but how many pixels per millimeter are sampling the lens. Higher pixel counts per millimeter not only help in resolving issues such as aliasing, but they eventually reach a density where they can produce good resolution and color even at the red and blue channels, each of which only uses one quarter of a total sensor. And just in case you are thinking about how many megapixels do I really need and you're contemplating dropping a few thousand dollars in some 30 to 50, 60 megapixel astro camera, to produce a full image on a 4K video monitor, you need 8.3 megapixels. And that's all. 8.3 megapixels will give you a great image on an entire video monitor. All right, this video is getting to be long enough. If you feel I got something in error or simply have a different opinion or saw something you like or just would like to add to this, please feel free to comment below. And finally, here's a little something to think about. Remember earlier when I said that theoretically you lose 20% resolution, but in reality with modern processing techniques, it's much, much less, maybe as little as 5%. If you're still thinking that 5% makes a big difference, I just want to point out 
that in every color astro image that I put up in this video, I decrease the resolution by 5%. And that includes the side-by-side -side comparison of NGC 3132 taken with an orbiting telescope. Did you notice a difference in those images? Be honest now. So finally, it wouldn't be an astrophotography episode if I didn't close with an astrophotography image. So, here's an image of NGC 7635, the gorgeous bubble nebula, and NGC 7654, the Cassiopeia salt and pepper star cluster, which I photographed about a month ago with my Player One Uranus C, an uncooled one-shot color camera. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Now get out there and take some pictures of the sky.